good. That was a smooth start. So, um, at the moment, we are starting to explore what it means to be a community of the resurrection. Now, this is one of those lovely phrases that can be uh, interpreted in all sorts of ways, which is handy uh, for a series. Um, you could, for example, given that we're just coming out of uh, Easter Sunday a couple of weeks ago, you could really focus on the resurrection of Jesus. We are a community of the resurrection of Jesus. We are defined and united by the empty tomb, the resurrection. And that would be entirely true. But it's not what I want to look at this morning. An alternative is to focus on our own resurrection. Now again, you could look at this in different ways. You might be thinking, ah yes, the end times, when we will all be resurrected again and live with Jesus, and that will be lovely. But not that. This is our current, present resurrection into the new life that we are currently living. And this is the resurrection that Paul is talking about in the passage that we just heard. In verse 1, he refers to raised from the dead in the past tense. He's not saying we will be raised from the dead. He's saying we already are. We were dead and now we have been raised. We are resurrected. It's something that has already happened. Which means that as a church, we are a community of the resurrected already by merit of being here. And this, obviously, has implications. Uh, and Paul explores some of them in this passage, and that's what we are going to try and do this morning. And the first thing we're going to look at is this resurrection thing. Because in the passage, Paul talks in the past tense a lot. Uh, he says things like, you were raised from the dead. Your old sinful self has died. You have left your old sinful life. You have begun to live the new life. He's not looking ahead. He's not using anticipatory language. Won't it be great when? He's talking about things that have already occurred. He's not setting resurrection as a goal for us. Because it's happened. It's already happened. We're living in it. And this really informs the way that Paul talks to the Colossian church and the expectations he has for them. Don't do this, he says, because that was the old life and that life is gone. So he's not there sort of making some lovely, helpful suggestions. Wouldn't it be nice if he tried to be a bit nicer? He's not doing that. He's setting a really clear framework for what it means to live in this resurrection life. And we can see in the first half of the passage, uh, particularly verses 5 and 8, if you're uh, following with the Bible, that he highlights two particular groups of behaviours. In verse 5 we get some sexual sins, which is clearer in some translations than others, but that's broadly what it is. And then in verse 8, we get some sins of anger. Again, slightly clearer in some translations, but we've got these two groups of sexual sins, sins of anger, because angriness sins sounds silly. Um, and I was looking at N.T. Wright and some of his commentary on this, and he says this is very intentional. This is a very intentional setting of boundaries. And it's a very intentional setting of multiple boundaries. Because imagine a church community that picks up on verse 5 and it strives for sexual purity. We are absolutely on the line here. We tolerate nothing. Uh, you can't even wink at someone just in case. We are, we've got this. But at the same time, they gossip about each other. At the same time, they backbite each other well then, that purity is kind of worthless. It's still good, but it's, it loses its value because the church is still falling short of what it means to live in the new life. Or imagine a church that has managed perfect harmony. We never fall out with each other. We never argue. We never have a disagreement. And yet, in order to achieve that, they tolerate some really quite immoral behaviour because we can't challenge them. There might be an argument. 
Again, that's falling short of what it means to live in the new life because we're not grasping all of it. I think this probably applies more widely. If we, uh, as a church community, are really secure in, let's say, our giving, but we haven't yet grasped the value of serving, then we are missing out on part of this new life. We're grabbing bits of it, great, but we're also missing out. Resurrection life, if we really want to live it to the full, has to infuse every aspect of the way that we live. We cannot pick and choose. Um, let's look at it another way. Uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to me as 18-year-old uh, for a while. Uh, comes up a couple of times. When I was 18, I became a Christian just at the end of being 17. Uh, and that was in January uh, of this year. Not this year, sorry. January of the year I'm thinking about. Surprise, everyone, I was 17 in January. Um, it's not been a kind couple of months. Um, so in, back in the 90s when I was 17, I became a Christian. And later that summer, I went off to Camp America uh, in Texas, a place called Camp Hoblet Cell, um, which uh, was a huge Salvation Army camp. And I kid you not, huge, the staff the senior staff, all had golf buggies to drive around in because walking from one side of the camp to the other would just take too long. Um, so it, it was this vast, it had a horse ranch on the camp. You could ride out on your horse for a couple of hours, come back again. You hadn't left the camp. Um, it was huge. Uh, and kids from all over the Dallas, Fort Worth area would come into the camp, and that's where I was. Um, but when I was 17 or 18, um, I was still very much trying to figure out who I was um, in a faith perspective because faith was still very new to me but frankly in a just being a person perspective and it meant that I adopted lots of mannerisms from different things um, one of them being the film Wayne's World you may have heard of this Wayne's World party time yeah um, it was very cool in the 90s that's what I'm saying uh, and in the film, one of the things that a lot of the characters say is, sure, which kind of means, yeah, right, but is cooler because it's said by American people in a film. Uh, and when you're 17, that matters. And so I was using this word a lot. Uh, the thing is, if you've got a Sussex accent and you're in Texas, some of you are ahead of me here, uh, the word sure sounds a lot like a swear word. I'm not going to tell you what it is. If you don't know, excellent, you're very innocent, good. Uh, if you can work it out, don't use it. Um, but it sounds a lot like a swear word. And what happened was a lot of people thought that I was swearing at them and the kids. Um, did anyone tell me this? No, they let me carry on doing it. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, because they wanted to avoid conflict. They didn't want to offend me. They didn't want to cause a problem. No one quite knew how to speak to this guy who kept swearing at the kids quite seriously. Um, and then it was worse, because eventually they came and told me and went, you've got to stop using that word. Um, and then I was incredibly embarrassed, and that, it hadn't really helped, because I'm like, I've been saying that for weeks. Why did you not tell me? They didn't grasp both sides. They were so afraid of falling into anger, maybe, or correction, or me becoming angry that they let me carry on doing something that they all thought was immoral. See, it wasn't me that was affected, because I hadn't got a clue what was going on. It's a broad summary of me at 18, but specifically to, to this thing, I didn't know. I didn't realise people were misinterpreting this word. Actually, the problems were felt by the other members of the team. The ones who were either going, I think he's wrong and we should challenge him, but we're not challenging him, and now I feel that I'm falling short... Or ones who are going, he's really upsetting everyone else. He should be stopped. And yet we're not. There were people who were conflicted and therefore potentially not being able to fully live that life because they weren't challenging. Now, I'm not saying we should all be like bulls in china shops and wade into every situation feet first. Oi, you aware of that? It's not that. But we need to embrace every aspect of this resurrection life. We cannot hold on to one half and go, oh, the others will take care of itself. We have to grasp it all. So that's the resurrection life. 
But then there's also the community. If we're a community of the resurrection, there's two parts. Now, one of the interesting things about this passage um, isn't very obvious in English. It doesn't translate well. Um, you're probably aware that the New Testament was written in Greek. Um, and Greek often has multiple words, we'll come to another one of them later on, but multiple words that are just translated into the same English word. Right? So, for example, in Greek, they have lots of words that translate to the English word, you. Because in English, you has to do a lot of work. If I'm talking to one person, I say, you. If I'm talking to lots of people, I say, you. It's the same word, but it means something different. Um, the only difference being if you're Texan, in which case you say, y'all. Um, yes, you can tell I've been there. Um, it, and they actually use a different word. So I, if they're talking to me, they'd say you. If they're talking to a room, they'd say, y'all, need to listen to this. Um, which is actually quite helpful. So well done, Texas. Um, it's nice that something good has happened there. Um, so, um, no, they're lovely. They're lovely. Um, so in, in Greek... Paul has access to all these different words that we don't really see because they don't translate well. Um, and so he makes use uh, of words that, forgive my horrendous Greek pronunciation, humon and humius. No one knows different, but I'm um, probably not great. Anyway, uh, they use these words and they indicate second person plural. In English, y'all. Um, Paul is not writing to an individual. He's not saying you, specifically you, this person, you do it. He's writing to a community, to people whose lives are intertwined and connected. And you see this coming up even when he's talking about the old life. Look at those examples he gives. Don't say things that hurt other people. Don't lie to each other. In fact, most of the things that Paul tells us not to do are things that hurt other people that damage the community. If we live in the old life, we harm our community. And it matters because Paul assumes that that's the default. We are in a community because we are, and therefore living in the old life harms the people around us. How else could we live our faith if not in community? So um, if we go back to Texas, uh, back to the 90s, um, Another thing that I had adopted uh, since being very young uh, was that I uh, spoke with extreme sarcasm. Now, I realise that's very difficult uh, for you to believe now. Um, not as many people laughed as I thought they would, so that's good. I mean, no, now they are. <sighs> no. Um, or maybe yes, it's hard to know sometimes. Um, and this was the thing. So when I was 18, I... I I buried myself in sarcasm. If you've watched Friends and you think the character of Chandler is sarcastic, no. Oh, no. Uh, no, he is a beginner. Um, I was just incredibly sarcastic to the point where everything I said was either sarcastic or not sarcastic, but delivered in a very sarcastic tone of voice, making it appear sarcastic even though it wasn't, like meta-sarcasm or the reverse psychology of sarcasm. It was just how I spoke. And yet, this has stuck with me for 30 years because uh, uh, this, this guy came to me. He was a South African. He was called Barry. He wore sunglasses and a crocodile dundee hat. Um, and he said, you have to stop doing this because everything you say is worthless because no one knows what you mean. No one knows if you are telling the truth or not. No one knows if they can trust what you say or not. He didn't say your words are harming the community, but that's pretty much what he meant. Because you had people who took offence at things that I thought they would realise were jokes and they thought were being deadly serious. And I offended people. Or I had people who thought I'd complimented them. And then they were really hurt when they discovered that I hadn't. Everything I said was worthless because people didn't know how it meant or how it was meant to be received. And so I was harming people. My old life, my pre-Christian life, was harming the people that I was now in community with. 
Because those two things are unavoidably linked. We are in community. How are we treating our community? Because there is, there's obviously a positive to this, that because I was in this community, because I was in relationship with other Christians, and you didn't have to be a Christian to work on the Camp Hobble itself staff, but most people were, they were helping me to learn about the new life. People like Barry, who was older than me, he was a, an adult, 18 is adult, but you know what I mean, he was an older adult just doing camp for fun. Um, because he was older and wiser than me, he could sit me down and go, I need to talk to you. I need to help you grow into this new life. He helped me understand how I still had aspects of my old life to put behind me. Now we know that I was already fully resurrected into the new life. But I was still learning what that meant and how to live it. Now we're fortunate because Paul gives us some very clear guidance. Towards the end of the passage, he says, look, show mercy, be kind, be humble, be gentle, be patient, get along with each other, forgive each other. Most importantly, love each other. Why? Because love holds us together in unity. Love is the basis of community. If we want to be a community of the resurrection, we need to live lives of love. Lives that reflect the teaching and the example of Jesus. See, I, I have never felt resentful of those people in Texas who went, you've got to stop using that word, you've got to stop talking sarcastically. Because I know that they did it from a place of love. They weren't criticizing me, although it kind of felt critical at the time. They were helping me to grow. They were helping me to become a more secure part of the community that I was in. Paul goes on to say that everything we do or say, word and deed, I think was the wording in, in the verse, is there, is done in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, this is, this is, this is like a double-edged sword. This is an exhortation. Be encouraged. Everything you do is done in the name of the Lord Jesus. But also be cautious because everything you do is done in the name of the Lord Jesus. If I am doing this, whatever I am doing, or if I am saying this, whatever I'm saying, in the name of the Lord Jesus, is this something that Jesus would want me to do? I had a conversation with Kez once, um, back when she was driving around a big coffee lorry. Uh, had Voyager written all the way down the side and on the front and on the back. You knew who that truck belonged to. It belonged to the Voyager coffee people. And Kez said that came with this awesome responsibility because you always had to give way. You always had to back up down narrow lanes, even though you couldn't because it was a big truck. You always had to be the kind driver. Because if you weren't, People knew that it was the Voyager driver that had just cut them off or driven them into a hedge or run over their granny or whatever it was. Um, she didn't. It's just an example. Um, but because it was labelled as a truck, you were a representative of that company. Your driving represents that company for better or worse. Or another example, uh, and the reason I've got this down here, is uh, our youth camping tents are reaching the end of their working lives. Um, when we came back from Spree last year, uh, this had been holding up one of the tents. You can see it's a piece of someone else's tent, cable tied to two other pieces of someone else's tent, which was then bodged into the side of our tent to keep it up. Um, it, it needed work. So we've been looking to replace uh, the, the kind of carbon fiber rods. And um, an unnamed tent company Ask me later if you want to know who. Uh, they do not have a good customer service department. Um, I've been emailing them, and it's been quite frustrating. And by Tuesday, uh, having had a particularly unhelpful response, I typed out uh, what we shall describe as quite a tart email, um, which was just full of very sarcastic questions. Um, and I looked at it for a bit. And then particularly, I kind of, my eyes ran down to the bottom of the email, where my signature says... Dave Paulson, associate pastor, Credison Congregational Church, seeking God. Um, 
Yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, this is not good. That's, that's, that does not reflect well on the church. Uh, so I deleted it. I deleted the email. I thought, this is not important enough. It doesn't do anything useful. I deleted the email. Um, and that was just this moment where my old life reared its head. And fortunately, there was enough maturity in me to go, I'm going to squash this. Now, I need to point out, I mentioned this story to Abby uh, later that evening. And she went, why didn't you just delete your signature? Um, now, I need to point out, I, it's all right, it's all right. I need to point out, for legal reasons, that was a joke on Abby's part. She wasn't actually suggesting. It's ve- I had very clear that I had to mention that. If I use that story... I have to say this. Um, It was a joke. But the thing was, we both knew it was a joke because we both knew that that wasn't what was going to happen. If you have to conceal your faith to send an email, don't send the email. If you have to conceal your faith to do anything, don't do the thing. Possibly Bible smuggling into countries, Brother Andrew, you're okay. But in general, no. Because we represent Jesus through our words and actions. That's what in the name of the Lord means. We carry his badge, we carry his banner, we carry his reputation. And as Jesus put it, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. If we dip into the Greek again, uh, the word that is used for love is agape in this instance, which is unconditional love. We represent Jesus as a community of unconditional love. Not a community of love as long as it doesn't make us feel too uncomfortable. Not a community of love as long as we don't have to make any major sacrifices. Not a community of love as long as we're not having to be in confrontation with people. A community of unconditional love. A community that has put aside the old life in order to live in the resurrection. Full of mercy, full of forgiveness, full of love. So here is the challenge. Live in that resurrection life this week. Live as a representative of Jesus. Not in a kind of, what would Jesus do kind of sense. But, which is fine, but not just that. Remind yourself, my words are Jesus' words. As far as many people are concerned. My actions are Jesus' actions. If people know that I follow Jesus, and people know that I try to be like him, then what I do is what Jesus does. If I'm a follower of Jesus, my actions are Jesus' actions. Because why else would I be doing them? That's a lot to live up to. But we can do it. Paul, in his, uh, another letter to the Romans, he says that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus. Nothing can separate us. So if we are always in Jesus' love, then our old lives, which we've already left behind, can always be overcome. What is in us is greater than that which is in the world. We can always rise to that challenge, no matter how tough or difficult or frustrating it may seem. So this week and next week and the week after, let's do that. Let's be a community of the resurrection. Let's live in the love of Jesus. And let's live out the love of Jesus to the people around us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that through your life and love and resurrection, that we too have been resurrected, that we too can live in your love. And Lord, I thank you that you allow us to be your representatives on earth. Help us to live lives worthy of that calling. Help us to live in such a way that our speech and our actions, our word and deed are just as you would have it be, just as you would do yourself. Lord, we ask that you guide us, that you encourage us, that you strengthen us, that you keep us focused on you. 
so that we might show your love to each other, to our community, to our town, and to the world.